The number of organizations, community leaders, influencers, and journalists appalled by the New York Times coverage of transgender issues is growing by the minute. This week, GLAD joined with PFLAG, Women's March, the Transgender Legal Defense and Education Fund, and others in calling for the paper to do three things. One, stop printing biased anti-trans stories immediately. Two, listen to trans people by holding meetings with community leaders within two months. And three, hire at least four trans writers and editors within three months. Joining us now is the president and CEO of GLAAD, Sarah Kate Ellis. Sarah, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for having me. <laughs> of course. Well, we're going to get to the New York Times uh, top editor and how they're responding in a moment. But first, uh, these demands that GLAD has spearheaded, uh, these come after a year of coverage that can be called irresponsible, biased, and harmful to transgender youth wherever they live. One digital newspaper called Popula tracked the Times for a year and counted 15,000 words worth of biased front page articles. Mm -hmm. How has the paper gotten away with this, all this biased coverage? Although, I mean, they have some coverage that is in you know doing the right thing in terms of trans issues but this is egregious it's awful i think uh, so i want to backtrack it has been over a year um we as an organization and in coalition with uh, over a hundred other organizations have been working on this behind the scenes to try and have a civilized conversation and un, and and help them see what is actually happening here there are no trans people in this conversation when we've had when we've had conversations with them we have brought trans representation to the table in media and journalism so that there there is the voice at the table i think that's a big problem that we're having here i also think that um you know these so you did say there are some decent articles that are happening. The biggest problem here is really around science and opinion. In science, they're treating trans bodies, trans lives as if they're up for medical debate when right. all of the major medical associations have said actually the science is clear, concise, and we have plans around it that right. are working. Um, the Times does not see it that way. They do not feel that the American Medical Association, the American Pediatric Association are actually the authority on this. I'm not sure who they see as the authority on this, but they're, they are continuing. And even in their response to say that this is a debate, it is not a debate. Uh, we're not debating any other medical issues, are we? But we are debating trans lives and dignity. So I think that's a really interesting juxtaposition that we're seeing mm -hmm. in here and it, it's deeply rooted transphobia yeah. that's what it is at the end of the day mm -hmm. and so unearthing that exposing that is the way that we hopefully get to a place where this damage stops because the new york times is a powerful powerful media organization mm -hmm. what they say matters. Mm -hmm. It matters deeply. It affects people. I hear from people all the time in our community, parents of trans kids, how damaging this coverage is. Mm -hmm. So what they're doing in their papers is creating real world harm. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. I just want to clarify when we're talking about uh, the science and the medical piece of this, we're talking a lot about gender affirming care. And also I would imagine trans women in sports comes up. Both of those topics are big. And then the other side to the, is that's on the science side. And then on the opinion side, you know, what we've seen happen within the opinion section of the New York Times over the year, past year, is that there are no trans voices. There are actually two really, um, well-known anti-trans voices yeah. who are not trans folks, um, cis straight folks who are now um, being given this platform to report on and opine on trans lives, bodies, and how they exist in the world. Um, and so we feel very strongly that there needs to be trans voices in this and that the transphobic people who are on record as transphobic in many, many ways, many different ways, um, be, you know, have their opinion about other things, but not something they're not even an expert on. Right. 
Right. It's just, it's so wild. I, I wonder, I know that GLAD has had meetings with the Times, um, but would you talk about when did you first notice this really abhorrent coverage? And, you know, when did you start trying to reach out and what is, what has that looked like? You know, it's, it, um, we started noticing it about a year ago and it was, it was one offs. Mm -hmm. And so we thought, oh, you know, okay, maybe it was just this one time. And then there was another time and then there was another time. And by the third or fourth time we were, we said, there's a pattern here. Mm -hmm. um, so we started to address it with the New York Times and that we noticed a pattern and that this is in something really important that we need to have conversations about. Um, and as you can imagine, it's taken a long time to get to those conversations. I thought those conversations were going to yield um, better results than they did. And within those conversations, we did say um, no. In those conversations, by the way, there was no trans voices um, from from the from the New York Times side. And that is like even you and I sitting here talking about this, I mean, on behalf and as allies to the trans community, um, which I am, you know, very aware of, but still, where are the trans voices? And so we need them here. We need them also um, in, in those rooms. And um, it was clear that um, they felt that, that the, the science that has been that has been confirmed by these um, large organizations is up for debate as far as the New York Times is concerned. And that on the opinion front, that they felt that um, that was the, in service to a larger discussion and debate of, around um, trans exist, existence in this world. Um, so I also think it's really important to point out here that the anti-trans articles are the front page articles mm, yes, and are the articles that they share the most through their um, other platforms. So the, there are positive or fair and accurate articles that the New York Times is doing. Um, however, those are not being shared. Those are not on the front cover. And after this letter in coalition was delivered, so we delivered a letter with a hundred other organizations and then journalists, over a thousand now and counting, um, journalists have signed a letter about this coverage as well. And every time the New York Times responds, they point out glad. So they're trying to paint us as this activist group and that all we care about is what we want said versus what the truth is. And we are actually looking at the single source of truth and they are creating a, a conversation that, that doesn't exist and a dialogue that doesn't exist. The other thing that's really fascinating and I think is um, important to point out is that as glad we monitor this, you know, across the country in local papers are doing better than the New York Times and fair and accurate coverage of the trans community when it comes to science and sports oftentimes. So they're supposed to be the leader here. You, you mentioned that many of these articles are coming from the science and opinion desks and now quotes from these non-experts have been used in you know court and in the legislature to fight against trans youth, you know, to, to create bills targeting this vulnerable community. And would you talk about the impact of that on trans lives? Absolutely. So uh, as you said, the New York Times is the paper of record. And because of that, this has real world consequences. And politicians from Texas to Alabama are citing time stories as evidence to back up their agendas, um, to take away health care from trans people. So what is written in the Times is now being used to push policy forward at the state level across the country. And I wonder, do you have any thoughts about why this is happening? Is this just pure um, greed that they're trying to get as many subscribers and mm -hmm. eyes on the page as possible. It, it does seem to dovetail with the increased number of anti LGBTQ plus specifically trans bills that have been introduced over the past couple of years. I'm honestly perplexed. 
they were several years ago the leader in trans fair and accurate coverage mm -hmm. um, just a, a handful of years ago and now they are becoming um exploited exploitive i don't know if it's for clicks i don't know if they've brought in a new uh management team who is transphobic it i can't we cannot put our finger on what is going on there because they actually were the leader in this kind of coverage um, in a fair and accurate way. And, um, and now it has really changed over the last year and we don't know what's driving it. Oh, gosh. Well, I mean, the good news is that there is now this pressure campaign on the New York Times and GLAD is at the forefront with many other organizations. This week, there was a billboard truck driving around the Times office. The message was, Dear New York Times, stop questioning trans people's right to exist and access medical care. What are the next steps? Well, I think, you know, we would really like um, for them to respond in a meaningful and impactful way. Because right now, all they've done, their response, honestly, has been as ill-informed as their trans coverage. Um, they're trying to paint it that it's just about GLAD and GLAD is an activist organization and an advocate organization. And we are that. However, we are very fair-minded individuals at the organization. And we take this really seriously. Um, and I think that what we would like to see is a conversation. And we'd like to see them come to the to the table to listen to the trans community and the leadership of the trans community. Um, and they are not even acknowledging trans people in their response. All they're acknowledging is GLAD and trying to make this a battle between the New York Times and GLAD. This is not about GLAD at all, actually. Right. It's about trans folks and they're not even in their response to continue to disrespect trans folks. Yeah, it's unacceptable. Well, you have big names, including Judd Apatow, uh, Margaret Cho, Wilson Cruz, Tommy Dorfman, Lena Dunham, Amy Schneider, Gabrielle Union Wade. These are all folks who signed on uh, and joined these organizations to call on the New York Times to do better. And um, you also have some New York Times contributors agreeing with you on the issue. Uh, what can you say about this very strong statement that New York Times contributors are coming out and pushing back against this very media outlet? I think they're noticing what's happened in over the past year um, and that they see this shift in fair and accurate reporting turning into biased clickbait, um, you know, radicalness um, on the trans community and they're perplexed as well. It doesn't make sense. This isn't making sense to all of us. And we're trying to have, have legitimate conversations. And um, the New York Times is digging its heels in. And you know, it's, it's, a, it's, it's a horrible thing because at the end of the day, what this does is cause more damage to the trans community. Right. Well, after all of this, this pressure, the New York Times this week published an op-ed in defense of J.K. Rowling, who is a noted horrifying uh, turf, uh, trans-exclusionary radical feminist. Uh, and Times executive editor Joe Kahn sent a memo to staff saying public criticism would, quote, not be tolerated, saying that journalists who signed the petition violated the paper's ethics policy against attacking fellow journalists. Uh, so the Times is clearly doubling down. How do we how do we deal with this at this point? I mean, is it time for a boycott? Um, you know, we're we're um, we'll never say um, any of our tactics are off the table at this point. Um, they did double down. It was really honestly disheartening that the day after we called on them, we're calling on them because they're in a powerful position and they have an enormous voice and they continue to use that voice to damage a marginalized community. And they can't see that. And that is, is mystifying to me um, because when you are given that kind of privilege of that kind of power to have such hubris, 
around who you are and arrogance that you're not even open to exploring this conversation. So I think having published this baseless op-ed mm. by Pamela Paul, a, a cis straight white woman defending JK Rowling, another cis white straight woman asserting that she is not transphobic. It says it all there. It's like all there. The, the, the arrogance and ignorance is all right there. And I am shocked that they can't, they cannot look in the mirror. Yeah. Well, I mean, Sarah Kate Ellis, thank you so much. Uh, President and CEO of GLAD, thank you so much for your time. Um, and thank you for joining us. The last check, uh, more than 4,000 people had signed the petitions. I'm one of them. <laughs> thank you. Um, of course, you can, you, audience, can also sign the lender letter and send a copy of it to the New York Times at glad.org slash New York Times. You'll find this link on advocate.com and on advocatechannel.com. Thank you very much.